Um, now I'd like to introduce our next speakers for the day. Um, we have Elaine Lazda and Julie Slicko. Elaine Lazda is a, an associate librarian at the Dewey Graduate Library at the University at Albany. She is the primary point person on site searching, bibliometrics, and alt metrics for the university libraries and works closely with Dewey staff on scholarly communications and open access issues. Julie Slicko, PhD, is an instructional developer in ITS and part time lecturer for the School of Education at UAlbany. Dr. Slicko holds a PhD in Educational Psychology and Methodology, a master's degree in Special Education and Elementary Education, and a certificate in Advanced Studies in School Building and Leadership. So please welcome Elaine Lasta and Julie Slicko. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Um, please advance the slide. Okay, so I'm gonna just briefly talk to you about, we talked a little bit about this this morning. Um, what is open and why? Why should we have open educational resources um, and open access? So open equals free, obviously. Many of us here know that already. Um, but some of you may not be as familiar with the five R's. So it's free to reuse educational resources, free to revise, remix, retain, and redistribute. So this is all educational materials, not just journals, not just textbooks. Um, no restriction, so you're free to customize, adapt to your own use, for your own use, for your own course. You can remix several different um, open, um, open educational materials, retain and, and redistribute. So it's actually really a great thing. And why should we do this? Well, for one thing, the benefit is for the students. Um, and interestingly enough, I started on this journey um, during my course, my teaching in special education. I have students reflect at the end of the semester um, how the course worked for them, what didn't work, talk about their metacognition and their own learning. And I actually had a student that said, um, this was about two semesters ago, with all the open educational resources and all the free access, why are you still requiring us to buy a textbook? So it got me thinking and it got me researching and it got me um, looking into it and um, that's how I got hooked up at the lane. Um, and so here to promote these uh, for students, the Bureau of Labor's um, statistics reports that in the last 10 years tuition has increased by 63% and textbooks have risen even more, 88% in the last 10 years. Um, so the point of opening resources is to break down barriers for people that can't afford. I know myself, when I was an undergrad, I couldn't afford to buy textbooks. I went to the library and took them out and did my homework there in the library. So we're trying to break down those barriers. The benefit to the instructors, uh, the instructors and the institution is that recent research um, is showing that open access materials actually improved retention and student learning outcomes, um, and that's a study done by Fisher and colleagues in 2015. And for the researcher, it improves collaboration and, and visibility of your work, which we all heard about this morning. There's different models. Um, many people, when we talk about open access, most people think of just textbooks, and it's not just textbooks. Um, we learned this morning more about articles through the Directory of Open Access Journals, doaj.org. Um, it's a community-curated online directory of indexes that provides high access, um, or excuse me, access to high-quality um, peer-reviewed journals. And audio, um, everybody's familiar with podcasts. Video, I would say YouTube was probably the pioneer in open access videos. And software, um, there's freeware out there and shareware. And shareware is used um, in contrast because it actually allows the source code to be available so that um, students and faculty can actually see the code and reuse it. So Elaine's gonna give us some specific um, examples, some unique examples of faculty that have um, created open access material. Elaine? So this first one is um, Trudy Jacobson. Who knows Trudy? 
library extraordinaire. Um, she has used Open SUNY to create uh, an information literacy textbook that uses the uh, ACRL framework, and um, it's pretty much a standard PDF download. Uh, it's uh, again open access, and it's through the Open SUNY. So I'm just going to go through a couple different platforms, a couple different things that can be done. Who came last year? Anybody come last year? Did um, uh, P.D. Magnus, a philosophy professor here at UAlbany, talked about his textbook, uh, For All X. He does not have this on one of the sort of aggregator platforms that many of the OERs are on now. He's sort of a, well, he wasn't sort of. He actually was on the forefront of open access. And if you click, um, get a copy. The cool thing about this is uh, he's got it as a latex source. That's a, a like a shareware kind of a thing. It's computer formatting. He doesn't have it in a PDF. He doesn't have it in a Word document. Uh, this thing has been reused and remixed in foreign languages, in other countries. Um, one of the things uh, that is sometimes a challenge with open access, uh, open educational resources, is the editing and the formatting and that sort of thing, right? Editing your textbook. So he made, um, Dr. Magnus made extra credit points for students who found mistakes in his textbook, which is kind of a cool way to get that done. Um, so that's kind of a neat one. Uh, can you click one of the, I don't know why there's two DNAs, but click one. This uh, came from uh, Merlot, which is an aggregator of many, many, many uh, open educational resources in a variety of topics. Um, if you hit the little, it's an animated, where is, I think that little uh, thing there, does it go? Oh, keep going. It's supposed to animate itself, but you get the idea. Um, it, it has sound, we don't have the sound right now, but um, it's, a, it's a little bit different. It's not a textbook, but it's something that people can work their way through, sort of an automated lesson kind of a thing that people can learn in a slightly different way that could not be done in a textbook way, and uh, probably some publisher would charge you an arm and a leg for supplementary materials like that, right? So um, the last one, this is um, from OpenStax.org. They take some pride in having a little bit more of a kind of hands-on approach to their open educational resources. You have to be a faculty member and prove you're a faculty member to get access and set up a profile. But they have this um, awesome statistics book. If you scroll down, Keep scrolling, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. So you see they've got, let's scroll back up. So there's community resources, instructor resources, um, sample syllabus, there's a lot of support materials here on OpenStax if you're an instructor that um, provide a value add for no money, right? No, no cost, so that's kind of cool. Um, can you pull my slides back up? So we, we have a very short amount of time, uh, Julie and I, so I wanted to talk about, you know, the theme for Open Access Week this year is OA in Action. So maybe this should be OERs in Action. And I know we have a lovely contingent from ITS, thanks to Julie's uh, urging and arm twisting to have her colleagues show up. So the roles for IT, um, encouraging faculty to incorporate OERs in the learning management systems, in Blackboard, those sort of things. Staying up to date on the latest technology, customizing um, OERs, helping faculty <laughs> assist in the customization of OERs for their classes and for their syllabi, uh, and working in the instructional design capacity to make these things work with the classes. The considerations or the challenges, there's a learning curve to stay up on the latest technology. Um, there are issues with accessibility for um, people with visual impairments, some of that sort of thing. Not all of the OER platforms are particularly accessible for people with disabilities, and that's a concern. Um, and then integration with the existing platforms. You know, we want everything to play nice together technologically wise. Is that English? Um, <laughs> technologically? So, um, so that's a challenge for our IT people. For libraries, uh, OERs in action for libraries. We can be the hosts with our institutional repositories. Uh, I went to a, a session not too long ago, Library Publishing Forum, which talked about 
The one thing our students want from the library is textbooks, and it's what most of us don't provide in the library. And this is a vehicle to do that. So maybe we're hosting them on the IR. Maybe, you know, then we, it's not really a challenge to put them in the catalog. If they're updated, they're updated. It's not a big financial consideration. Then we can make that available. It doesn't have to be on reserve, and there's only one copy. People can access it. Um, we can recommend the good ones that other people have created, the good OERs out there. Um, people from other institutions, maybe you would recommend for all X to your philosophy professors. Or sometimes now on the listservs I'm seeing, uh, as a social work librarian, I see, are there good social work OERs out there that you guys use, other social work librarians, that are credible, you know? So there's some of that uh, starting to happen in the library community. And then, of course, we can be the ones that are like, yeah, go for it, you know, use the OERs, and here's the IT people, they'll help you, like, with the tech stuff. And we, our challenges and considerations, copyright, um, is Karen still here? Karen? <laughs> Karen will be copyright advising for things like this uh, in the near future. Uh, we have to stay up on the existing resources, the existing platforms that are current, accurate, and authoritative, like any information that we would want to provide to our users. And of course, there's resources. Uh, this is probably true for any group that I'm talking about, but we need the staff to manage and, um, the repository and the things that we are hosting, the generated content for our faculty and our users. Instructors, any instructors here? Couple, couple, three, four. So I would urge you, instructors, to incorporate OERs into your course materials to develop and maintain your resources, keep them current, keep them authoritative, keep them on the edge, uh, champion them to your colleagues, spread the word. You know, um, word of mouth is the best way to get this stuff out and into the field and make it common practice. The challenges for faculty, of course, is does a textbook count for promotion and tenure? Yeah, sort of, kind of, not so much, right? Um, it's hard to judge the impact of a, a textbook. Uh, it looks good, but it's not a scholarly peer-reviewed journal article in a high impact factor or in the humanities, it's not a book with the right publisher. So um, consider taking sabbatical time to develop an OER. Consider looking for grant funding to handle those parts that are not content related, the, the copy editing, the format, the layout, um, working with us to get it on the repository platform, things like that. And um, you know, the challenge again remains continuous updating or replacing it or modifying it. And you can do this with not just starting one on your own, as Julie was talking about, you can take somebody else's OER and often revise and remix it and tailor it to your own class and your own needs. So that's kind of a really cool thing. You don't have to start from scratch. So I'm super early, but um, Julie and I would like to announce <laughs> that uh, this spring we're going to work together and offer some resources um, workshops on how to access existing OERs, how to, if I forget something, jump in, how to access existing OERs, how to modify them, um, models, go into more models, go into the copyright issues, things like that, and you can look for a library guide from the libraries, you can look for hosting from us, and you can look for copyright advisement and some other uh, logistical issues and making those things discoverable to your students. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned when you were talking on one of your slides about OERs, oh, and students coming into the library and saying, oh, I'd love to be, the thing that they request the most are textbooks. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about putting them into the, um, your repository. Mm -hmm. um, unless it's, it's, uh, creative Commons or something. There's mm -hmm. copyright issues. Right, right, right. right. And there, uh, I, I sort of thought this was going to take, we only had half an hour and I thought this was going to take a little bit longer. There are logistical licensing and copyright mm -hmm. issues that need to be addressed. Um, there is Creative Commons, I think you just mentioned that, right? Mm -hmm. Did you just say yeah. that? Um, and there's various, um, you know, with attribution or without attribution right. and commercial and non-commercial. And, and those things do need to be considered when you're creating your own or when you're remixing somebody else's. And um, that will be why we're doing 
our guides and workshops to get into more details because it's very it can be very nuanced, you know. Right. But the published textbooks normally could not go into the repository. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So I'm the author of two open source textbooks. Awesome. Uh, one is uh, Calculus 2, and the other one is in differential equations. There's so both of them on the math side. And like I said, I have three, three short observations. The first is that because I have a computer science background, and I can do Waytech, which is the software that was used to generate the book all over X. Um, because I have that computational background and, and, and that coding background, I can easily do all of the typesetting, formatting, organizing, making the book look good myself, which is a skill that I recognize that most individuals might not possess. Maybe there's something to be said about, about training, but, but, but all that to say, that there are some folks at any universities that do have some of the skills that they're able to take ownership of, 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 of the project in its entirety without having to be concerned about, well, I'm writing the content and then someone else is organizing it and then I have to look at it again and so on and so forth. And so that, that was my first, my first observation. The second is, from a promotion and tenure committee point of view, I don't know, I don't know yet, ask me in a year, whether, whether open source textbooks matter in terms of my file being reviewed. But one thing that I'm hoping will make a difference is that professional societies have started creating committees that, that review open source textbooks. Um, and so in my case, I, I'm submitting both of mine to a committee of the American Mathematical Society uh, so that they can take a look and examine it and write a letter of opinion that's kind of hopefully carries similar weight to the letter of a publisher saying, we're, we're going to print your book. Um, and, and, and provide that kind of same, a comparable level of review right. as if it was a publisher-published book. And then the third, the third thing that I, I wanted to comment on is this. Um, I've seen so many talks about open source textbooks that start with, the books are free and our students would love that. And, and, and interestingly enough, over the years that I've used my own textbooks in my own courses, the, the book being free doesn't seem to be something that my students care about much. Um, now admittedly, there might be a difference between a, a public institution versus a, like a small private college. My students all drive fancier cars than I do. Uh, and, so, and so the price of the textbook really isn't an issue. What they really like about my textbook, at least I, talk, I, I think I hope, is, is the flexible way in which they can use it. It's just a PDF. They can print it and throw it in a binder. If they cover it in ink, they don't feel bad because they're not ruining a $100 book that they might not be able to sell for quite so much money. They like the fact that they can easily access it on their phone, on their tablet, on a laptop computer. It's just so multimodal because that PDF has absolutely no restrictions on it. They can use it in so many different ways that even publisher textbooks that offer several modes of access, there's still restrictions, there's passwords, there's you know, limited ways in which you can access it. Um, so I think that while we often, we often talk about how great it is that the books are free, I think that another thing that we should talk about just as much, if not more, is the flexibility that comes from, from, that, from those materials. Right, well, it's certainly not free beer, it's free puppies, right? Free beer, you just drink, you're done. Um, you, you know, that's free. Yeah. But free puppies, you get the free puppy. You have to feed it. You have to walk it. You have to go to obedience class. You have to clean up after it, right? So there's that issue. Um, you're right about the, you know, the peripheral issues around formatting and layout, and not everybody can do LaTeX, and you know, um, there's a lot of different issues regarding that. And the, um, there are some. Some libraries that provide that service to faculty members, uh, UAlbany is not in a position to do that right now, so I didn't go into that in great detail. I don't want to get people all excited and then be like, well, we're not doing it. So, um, so there's that. Uh, with the promotion and tenure, I've heard a number at the Library Publishing Forum last year in Texas, I heard a number of schools, particularly small liberal arts schools, that are really making inroads. Uh, for, for primarily teaching schools, four-year liberal arts kind of schools, not so much research universities, but that the textbooks matter in promotion and tenure for those schools, and they're really effectuating cultural shift in certain institutions to do that. And I hope there's sort of a, you know, a concentric ripple effect, I guess that's what I'm trying to say, uh, you know, that, that that will eventually come to us as well. Uh, I think that's an excellent point, and I'm sure your tenure case looks great. So, um, and then the last thing, was the multi 
in modal, which is yeah. actually a really good point because um, if you buy, a ton, if you have a publisher's textbook as I did, um, and you assign, I learned that if you assign pages, I don't assign chapters, I assign sections, um, the other modalities are different page numbers, um, which makes sense, but yeah, I would think an e-copy looks exactly the same as the printed copy, and it's not, and it caused a lot of confusion, so that's an excellent point, and I think we should, we'll add that into our slide, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and then would you like to come consult with <laughs> And she reminded me of the other thing you were talking about, you don't see that your students are not buying uh, proprietary textbooks, so um, I've heard crazy statistics that particularly um, people who are, you know, for whom going to college is a challenge to begin with, they skip the textbooks. You know, they get this financial aid for tuition, they don't get anything for books, and then they just skip the books, and if they can't get them on reserve at the library, which, you know, that's kind of hit or miss here at UAlbany, that is true. what are they going to do, you know? And so, um, I've heard a lot of momentum on the student side. I've heard of um, student sort of unconferences and uh, meetings and stuff to, to bring awareness uh, on other campuses, not so much here. But um, I was sort of hoping there'd be more students here today so they could go like, yeah, testify, you know, but that didn't happen. Um, the EO, like we have a, um, I don't know the exact number, but we have an e a large EOP population, and they have recently lost federal funding. Um, so I hoped they would be, <laughs> those folks would be here too, championing it. But um, so it is a big, it is a big deal. I mean, I'm speaking from experience as from my undergrad, not buying textbooks. I mean, $150 a pop. Back then, was I mean that was ridiculous money, um, and I know that the textbook I was using in my course is well over hundred. Yeah. So that's that's a lot times four or five courses. And yeah, our, I don't think our students drive fancy cars. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering, you mentioned a study that talks about how OERs increase retention. And was that because of the multi-modalities that they are, like they are accommodating different learning styles? Or are you talking more about sort of these animated interactions, you I, know, um, interactive tools that you find online versus just a, a textbook that's online? I'd have to remember, from my memory, what I remember is an experimental one, um, the classrooms that, or the courses that they bought textbooks and the courses that used open educational resources, it was more accessibility, not being able to afford the textbooks. Um, so, but I don't recall there being um, incorporation. I remember if they were talking about universal design for learning or anything. It could be. It could be. Um, I can definitely send you the article. I just, I don't remember exactly what I'm Memory's not so good these days. <laughs> Are the workshops and the resources and everything free to anybody? Or is it just for any student in Albany? Um, how do you guys do it? At the library, if we do it through the library, they're open to everybody. So maybe we'll do some through the library and some. Yeah. We're going to take over the world. 